Night gathers, and now our podcast begins. It shall not end until we're done talking. We are the princes that were promised. Welcome to the princes that were promised. It's me, it's Shawnee Wan, and with me, as always, it's John. John, a lot of TV stuff today. A lot more TV stuff today than we've had in quite some time. What do you think, nine months away? October, November, December, January, me, seven months. All we know for sure is it's the first half of 2019, right? Nothing else is confirmed. I got to be honest, I've been very, very nervous lately. I, I began a sick feeling in my stomach. <laughs> is this Sansa Stark related or? Uh... No, no. Uh, no, the only good the bad news about that, the latest like I read has her dying, but it doesn't look like that. That's true. So that's upsetting. Now, I'm just, <laughs> I'm setting myself up. I'm setting myself up at this point. I really am. Why? I just feel it. I just feel it. The guy set up for all this time, he's going to die. I don't think that you've read too many spoilers because I don't think there's too many spoilers out there. There's leaks. Well, there's 10,000 leaks and it's just, you know, it's like, which one's going to be true? And we're going to talk about one in particular in the back half of this episode. Hopefully, we'll remember to give a spoiler warning. HBO's security for season eight has been top notch. These guys should consider joining the Secret Service after Game of Thrones airs. In the past two seasons, it's been pretty much like... Season five was the one with the... It was a four-episode leak, like yeah. months before the yeah. fucking... <laughs> but even then, we didn't really get too many, like, written leaks. Season six, you know, there are so many leaks. So many pictures of John, you know, there's his resurrection. Right. Everything you knew is out there. Well, I guess the thing with season six is that the cliffhanger of John being betrayed by the Night's Watch and stabbed to death, apparently. People just didn't know if it was true or not, and people thought he might come back. And that was the big thing leading into season six. Obviously, that was the major plot point. Kit Harrington, Hair Watch. People were generally wondering if he was alive. So there was interest in finding out before season six aired. Let me add something. And this came out like last year. One of the directors made mention of it, and I don't know how it was brought up again, but I know, you know, George has been very quiet, brook related. Any type that is meaning John chapters anymore after the Dance Dragons, he's trying to make it look like he's actually dead. Great job, George. But he, he's got such a big mouth. Back in season one on the set, George mm-hmm. said, you know, well, this stuff's important, but the most important thing is we have to get Danny and John together. That's the important thing. So you just ruined it. You know, it's out there yeah. already that, he, you're, he, that he's going to come back, in your own words. Plus, he says it's important, but I don't, I don't see that happening in The Winds of Winter. If we get The Winds of Winter, I don't see him being able to move the plot fast enough where we actually right. see them meet in that book. It would be a very late Winds of Winter thing, and I still think there's going to be three books I, at this point, and really do. We don't even have Tyrion and, and Danny together yet. Right, so how are we going to get John and Danny together? Well, enough about Martin. Although, one bit of news about Martin. He did a some kind of appearance. I believe it was actually in Spain. And he was doing some sort of Q&A session with the crowd. The moderator asked him right off the bat about the winds of winter. And he said, it's coming. I'm working on it. That was that. Sometimes I have flashbacks to when I used to care about this book. And when I used to be excited at the prospect of it being released. It happened the other day. I was at work and I was like, I haven't thought about The Winds of Winter in a really long time. I wonder if it's going to be published soon. But alas, it's not. A couple things to talk about today. First off, the security for HBO has been outstanding for Series 7. Eight. For Season 8. It was horrible for Season 7. You would know better what kind of leaks besides the stolen episodes. It was just like legit leaks. Everything just flowed in with what we knew with new actors on, you know, on the set, mm-hmm. where they were, where they were filming. Whereas this season, I mean, I must have read about six, seven different leaks that supposedly are from people who are on the set 
And for the most part, they're all different. They all have different endings. YouTube leak. And I wanted to say, you can't buy this, really, because they had the Battle of Winterfell for Episode 4. There's one thing we do know is the Battle of Winterfell is going to be Episode 3, because that's the episode that Mikhail Sapochnik is directing. Yeah, then that's Episode 3. Yeah, that's going to be Episode 3. He's also doing Episode 5, so I'm going to also safely assume the Battle for the Dawn is going to be in Episode 5. And in between that is going to be the remnants of everything and the setup for the next big battle. And this one had that it was episode four. I'm just like, dude, it's so wrong. Dude. Just, I'm, I'm not believing it because this whole entire episode is wrong. Yeah, I mean, you can tell that that doesn't click. It doesn't make sense. I also remember there was that one, I guess, a plot point leak because it wasn't a script leak, but it was on YouTube and it was shortly after season seven ended. And it was all six episodes, I believe, or definitely at least five episodes. And it glossed over whatever happens with the Night King. And it featured Howland Reed. Yeah, those are the first leaks. He's not even yeah. to be casted. One of the latest leaks. For a day, I was just like, God, I just hope this is true. It had Sansa <laughs> dying, draped over the, the walls of King's Landing. That would be the greatest episode ever. That's not going to happen. There's just no, no. way she's going to die. It's just no way. Definitely not going to happen. I think there's a couple of things that definitely are happening compared to some of the, the pictures we have seen. I mean, there's been some leaked pictures of Jon Snow being being someplace. I don't want to get too spoilish. Right. I got a feeling that there's going to be a, a, a mission involving Jon. I mean, not him, but people around him. All right, we'll talk more in depth about it after we talk about the Emmys. And we'll give you the spoiler heads up when we get to that. The point that I was saying is HBO security has been jacked up. It's done a great job with this season, especially for the length of time between the end of Series 7 and Series 8 airing and length of time between the end of Series 8 filming and when it will actually air, which we don't even know for sure yet. Do you think we're going to get like a teaser pretty soon by the end of the year? Yeah, end of the year we'll get... We'll get some sort of teaser, just because HBO always does their beginning of the year, the 2019. Yeah, I think even something before that. I mean, they've been filling for over a year now. Like, give us something. A 45-second teaser. The Season 7 teaser, that came out at the end of March, and Season 7 yeah, this has in to, July, uh, right? Yeah, I gotta see. Something around the holidays, around November or something. Give us something. And not just like an HBO quick look when they show them what their new series is. Give, give us it's, something. It's like a banner and like <laughs> camera. And like Macy Williams saying how this season is the best one ever. Last woman standing. Okay, Macy, you're not the last woman standing. And anyone who believed her, you know, please. I got a bridge to sell you also. We'll also tell you that Renly's not gay. Neither yeah. That. Rhaegar's alive and well. Well, a lot of people believe he is alive and well. Oh, God. Well, not so well, I guess, right? If Mance Raider's Rhaegar Targaryen, the Mance Raider in the shows is not well at all, and in the books is probably not well at all also. Captured by uh, Ramsay. <laughs> yeah, if Mance Raider is really related to Rhaegar in the show, they really did a horrible job casting him. That you, you could get, oh my god. <laughs> I know you already don't like the casting of Mance Raider in the show. I didn't hate it. I, you know what? I, casting I didn't mind so much, it was just the character that was just kind of soulless compared to his book counterpart. Mm -hmm. John, did you know that Game of Thrones holds the Emmy Award record for a scripted television series with 47 primetime Emmy awards? Not nominations, awards. Really? 47? Yep. That's a lot. And second place with 37 is Frasier. Wow. That's crazy, right? If you give me 10 guesses, I would never say Frasier. I would have gone through like... Sopranos, Cheers, Breaking Bad, Mad Men, Friends, ER. I would have gone through like Beavis and Butthead before I got the Frasier. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, Frasier would have been. Well, no, because the fucking uh, Kelsey Grammer was always winning. Yeah, but you, you would never remember that, though. Who would, yeah. would, you actually, would you remember that he was big time back then? No, I, I, I wouldn't. No, I definitely wouldn't. I remember watching the first season of Frasier, but that was just because I liked to watch Cheers. You know, I watched episodes there and there. You know, it wasn't bad, but I would never, like, gosh, this is an Emmy Award winner comedy here. You know, I just would never, like, remember to think that. Uh, you know what? This is some Emmy Award. <laughs> some Emmy Award stuff right here. By the way, uh, one night in the city, I saw I walked past his brother, Miles Crane. Oh, that dude? Yeah. He was in the, I walked past him in the city one time. Say what's up to him? Ah, uh, no, he was with his, uh, I guess his boyfriend, I guess. Oh, uh, definitely his boyfriend. 
not that there's anything, told not that episode one. Not that there's anything <laughs> wrong with that. Oh <laughs> uh, no, no, there's definitely nothing wrong with it, but it's just obvious. Nile, right? Niles or Miles? Niles was his name. Or is it oh Niles, whatever. Miles, Niles. <laughs> whatever, it doesn't matter. <laughs> Smiles. <laughs> uh in 2013, the Writers Guild of America listed Game of Thrones as the 40th best written series in television history. Okay, that's great. I'd be pretty hard pressed to come up with 39 better written shows, but okay. 2015, The Hollywood Reporter placed it at number four on their best TV shows ever list. Okay. 2016, the series was placed seventh on Empire's The 50 Best TV Shows Ever. The same year, Rolling Stone named it 12th on the greatest TV shows of all time. So these, these fucking magazines got to get their shit together. They're all over the place. The 2011 first season of Game of Thrones received 13 Emmy nominations, including Outstanding Drama Series, and it won for Outstanding Supporting Actor in a Drama Series given to Peter Dinklage for his portrayal of Tyrion Lannister. And it also won for Outstanding Main Title Design. It was also nominated for Outstanding Directing in Winter is Coming. I think that might have been uh, Alan Taylor, maybe. I'm just guessing, though. Outstanding writing for Baylor. Was it George Martin? Did he write Baylor? No. Baylor, uh, George Martin, Martin, Worth. Um... Oh, uh, Pointy uh... Stick him with the Pointy Yes. Yes. Yeah. All right. Well, it won for Outstanding Writing for Baylor. 2012, the second season, it received six Emmy Awards from 11 nominations, including... Outstanding Drama Series and Outstanding Supporting Actor in a Drama Series for Peter Dinklage. I'm going to stop you right here, right now. I'm stopping you where you're going with the train. Have you seen... It's already... Uh, That's why you get pissed off. It's just Peter Dinklage. Peter Dinklage. Peter Dinklage. Yeah. I mean, you get the first season. Yeah. And maybe even the second, okay. Because he was very... Especially the ending episodes of that season, he was very good, but... Well, he was the top build star in the second season. Yeah. I can't tell if he... If he won for that or if he was just nominated. The sentence is worded kind of weird. 2012, the second season received six Emmy Awards from 11 nominations, including Outstanding Drama Series, Outstanding Supporting Actor. I don't think Dinklage won back-to-back. I mean, nominated. 2013, third season received 16 Emmy nominations, including Outstanding Drama Series, Outstanding Supporting Actor in a Drama Series for Peter Dinklage. But then some of the other cast get some recognition. Outstanding Supporting Actress in a Drama Series for Amelia Clark. Outstanding Guest Actress in a Drama Series, Diana Rigg. Outstanding Writing for The Reigns of Casimir. But only won two Creative Arts Emmys. 2014, the fourth season, received four Emmys from 19 nominations. That's crazy, 19 nominations. Outstanding Drama Series. Outstanding Supporting Actor in a Drama Series. You guessed it, Peter Dinklage. Outstanding Supporting Actress in a Drama Series, Lena Headey. Outstanding guest actress, Diana Rigg. The fucking Emmys love Diana Rigg. Well, because she's old school. I mean, she's, yeah. you know... Yeah, everybody gets to gush when she goes on stage. Outstanding directing for The Watchers on the Wall. And outstanding writing for The Children. Now, the fifth season won the most primetime Emmy Awards for a series in a year. That's the record. That's like the Titanic of the Emmys. It won 12 awards from 24 nominations. It won Outstanding Drama Series. I think season five was the first one to win. Yeah. Outstanding series. Other wins included, you can take a guess, Outstanding Supporting Actor in a Drama Series for Peter Dinklage, uh, Outstanding Directing for Mother's Mercy, Outstanding Writing for Mother's Mercy, and then eight more were just Creative Arts Emmys. 2016, the sixth season received the most nominations for that particular Emmy Award ceremony or whatever. One Outstanding Drama Series, Outstanding Directing for Battle of the Bastards, Outstanding Writing, Battle of the Bastards. And then nine more Creative Arts Emmys. Nominations that didn't win, you know what I'm going to say. Outstanding Supporting Actor in a Drama Series for Dinklage and for Kit Harington. Outstanding Supporting Actress in a Drama Series for Amelia Clark, Lena Headey, and Macy Williams. Outstanding Guest Actor for Max von Sydow. Outstanding Directing for The Door. All right. Pretty cool. Last night's Emmys. John, you did not watch them. No. I didn't watch it. I didn't forget it was on, but I, I don't watch any of these award shows because it would just piss me off seeing just Hollywood. Hollywood in their yeah. disease infested. Uh, All their glory. Yeah, in their comments. It just, you know, I'm with, I'm with Daniel Block. I would never give them the benefit of watching and listening to their freaking 
baloney. And what difference does it make anyway? Like, if Game of Thrones wins, it's nominated. It really doesn't make a difference to me. I'm watching it anyway. No, oh God, they're gonna watch. They don't win Best Show, Best Picture 2017. They're gonna watch the final season. Dude, I only I only watch seasons that have won Emmys or are nominated for Emmys. The only television I'll watch. It had the most wins last night, also, but it was a narrow margin. It had nine total wins. Saturday Night Live had eight. Assassination of Gianni Versace had seven and a whole bunch of bullshit. Anthony Bourdain got a bunch. Is that the guy that killed himself, Anthony Bourdain? Yeah. All right, outstanding drama series. So, uh, Westworld, This Is Us, Stranger Things, The Handmaid's Tale, The Crown, The Americans, and Game of Thrones. I mean, that's like a no fucking contest right there. Mm-hmm. You know, there's like no The Sopranos. Right, there's, there's nothing no... in there that's like, oh my God, like that's, <laughs> that's some stiff competition. A lot of people like Stranger Things. It's okay. But I think The Handmaid's Tale won last year. That show just pissed me off. I, I, I tried watching that one. It just got me angry. I'm not surprised it won Outstanding Drama Series. Although I am a bit surprised that Series 6 didn't win Outstanding Drama Series. And Season 7 did. Nobody got nominated for Outstanding Lead Actor. Lead Actress? Nope. I guess everybody's just a supporting actor. Yeah, and an ensemble cast like that, there's, you're not going to yeah. find the lead. All right, so here we go. Outstanding Supporting Actor in the Drama Series. Matt Smith, the former Doctor Who, was nominated as Prince Philip on The Crown. Mandy Patinkin was nominated for Homeland. David Harbour for Stranger Things. Joseph Fiennes for The Handmaid's Tale. And then Nikolai Costa-Waldo nominated for Jamie Lannister. The specific episode being The Spoils of War. And then Peter Dinklage as Tyrion Lannister in The Dragon and the Wolf. Hold on, time out. Yeah. Time out, please. <laughs> I'm just tr- this is why it's such a joke, I, and I'm sorry I told the Peter Dinklage fans, and I like Peter Dinklage, I, and I like, you know... Oh, yeah, of course, Terry. yeah, he's great. But, like, uh, what did he... Uh, how did he, how did he beat Nikolai Costa-Waldo? It's just like, it's just, it's like... It's like the popular vote, that's what it basically is, oh, it's Peter Dinklage. The first half of that episode, he really didn't do anything. He has a conversation with, with Cersei, and then he's out there freaking... Again, shut down with his thing. He, he should go there with the dragons up to the north. Get shut down with that. And then he's out there peeping on John and Danny, looking all upset. Oh, boy. That's all he did, though. That's all he did in that episode. Well, you know what? Thinking back, like, it was good acting. But the point is, it's nothing that he hasn't done before. It's not as good as anything he's done before. Like, the scenes he had with Tywin were better. And I feel like the scenes he had with Cersei in season two, season three, were better than that. I just don't get it. Like, from that episode, you know, it's just, I don't know. It was textbook Dinklage. Should be nominated for it, but yeah, maybe give Nikolai Costa-Waldo a shot. It's like in baseball when they give like a gold glove to like a first base who's basically played 20 games at first base and 120 games in the freaking DH. So let's just give him the gold glove. Like he's played 20 games as a freaking DH and at first base. He used to always do that Rafael Palmeiro. He used to always get like the gold glove. Like, <laughs> yeah. He played like 20 games at first base. <laughs> How do you win a gold glove or a guy who's playing there 135 times, 150 times a year? Rafael Palmeiro. <laughs> Oh, nobody got... Oh, Lena Headey got nominated for The Dragon and the Wolf also. But she didn't win. Fanny Newton from Westworld. Whatever. Did anybody get nominated for that? New? I thought they'd figure out a way to get Diana Rigg another one. So, <laughs> <laughs> make up some uh, outstanding uh, guest appearance by a woman of uh, advanced age. No uh, Raman Jab- 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 Jabwadi. Oh, yeah. Uh, let me see. Outstanding directing for a drama series. Stephen Daltrey won for The Crown, but Alan Taylor was nominated for Beyond the Wall. Pedestal was nominated for Dragon and the Wolf. Daniel Sackheim was nominated, but for a different show entirely. Outstanding writing for a drama series. The Americans won, but Game of Thrones was nominated for The Dragon and the Wolf, written by Benioff and Weiss. And I believe, like, the production has to submit episodes, or, like, the actors submit an episode that they feel they acted their mm-hmm. best in. But that makes it even worse on Dinklage's prime. I, I can't imagine that that's the episode that he's in a peck. I don't know if they do fucking music awards at the Emmys. Well, listen, man. I, you know, I wish Nikolai Coster Waldo could have won. I wish Kit Harrington could have been nominated. But that being said... I'm glad Peter Dinklage won instead of Joseph Fiennes or David Harbour. 
Although I do like Mandy Patinkin. I think he's great. I got a lot of love for Matt Smith. Sidebar about Mandy Patinkin. Supposedly, he's one of the worst actors to deal with offset. I've heard the same thing, yeah. Although he's gotten better now that he's older, but yeah, I, I've, I've heard the same thing. He's just like fucking, like nobody wants to work with him. I'm surprised he hasn't gotten the Me Too. <laughs> <laughs> oh, man. I can't help but think about Lord of the Rings, right? When the Fellowship of the Ring, the two towers, they were both nominated for Best Picture and they didn't win. Really, any nomination that Lord of the Rings, those first two movies had, it didn't win anything, but then The Return of the King pretty they much... all sounds like, oh, all right, all right, it, here you go. They swept everything, right. Just just, just stay up here. Just stay up here, guys. Yeah, don't go anywhere. They might as well just say, just stay up here. Point being, Game of Thrones, around season three, season four, it hadn't won Outstanding Series yet, so I thought maybe that would be the case. It would just win every single category for its final season, but it's already the most decorated television show, as far as the Emmys go, in history, which is pretty crazy. But definitely not surprised that it won Outstanding Drama Series last night, because the competition just wasn't there. See, now, Season 5, that had some com- Better Call Saul, Downton Abbey, Homeland, mm-hmm. House of Cards, Mad Men. Like, that's that's like competition. Right. I think that was like Mad Men's final season, too. <laughs> Dinklage won Best Supporting Actor for <laughs> for Hard Home. <laughs> was he even in Hard Home? Yeah, I'm sure he had to have been, but like... Whatever. It's fine. It's fine. They win Emmys. That's what they do. We look at them as famous. We look at them as millionaires. But if you think about it, most actors that you see on TV, maybe they make a little bit more money than, well, they probably make a lot more money than you or I, but they're only like a bad year away from making a lot less money. And there's no shows being made. People can't work. The extras, the production crew, a show like Game of Thrones employs so many people on both ends of the camera that it's perfect for the Emmys to you know drop awards on. Same thing happens in the Oscars. You know, a movie like The Lord of the Rings employed so many people. That's why it wins. And it's generally those movies that win. So that's what's up, I guess. There was a trivia question about uh, a few weeks ago. I forgot what the name of the question was. It was, this movie in the past blah, blah, blah years was the only movie that was not like a drama that won Oscar for Best Picture. And for the life of me, I'm thinking back. To all the movies that, you know, because you get the Oscars, it's always a drama. It's always some stupid drama that wins Best Picture. Right. Was it Was it yeah. Shakespeare in Love? No, no, no. It was, it was The Return of the King. Oh, okay. And then oh, I, yeah, I just so. could not, I could <laughs> not think of it. I'm like, I'm thinking like all the movies, I'm thinking like, oh, back in the 90s, they, they had this, they had yeah. this. I can't think of No, the 80s, no. All of a sudden, boom. I'm like, oh, you got to be kidding me. Here I am, this freaking geek. I could not answer that question. Yeah. Completely just like slipped my mind that Return of the King won Best Picture. Are you at all excited or interested in the Amazon Middle Earth TV series? Um, Menza Menza. Yeah. You know, it's going to have to be something that's going to, I'm going to have to watch and be like, it's going to have to, it's going to have to do something. It's going to have to tickle me a little bit, you know what I'm saying? Are you glad it's not a retelling of The Lord of the Rings? I guess it's something different. At first, I thought that's what it was going to be. I thought it was going to be like a TV episode version. Which wouldn't be so bad if the movies hadn't come out as recently as they have. And I know the movies are going on, what? Way more than 10 years old now. Yeah, 15. It was like 2001, 2002, 2003, right? Yeah. Yeah, so it's like 15 years, 16, yeah. 17 years. You would need like another 10 years or so for like anyone to go out there and say, listen, we're going to redo some things. You know, we're going to make it a larger scope. We're going to put in, uh, what's that guy's name? Uh, Tom. Uh, uh, Tom. Tom Bobagill yeah. in there. Yeah, yeah you're, you're going to see stuff like that. Like that I wouldn't mind because the movies are so long anyway and there's plot points all over the place that I'd be okay with it in terms of expanding the story and fitting all that stuff in. Mm -hmm. The movies are just too good and they mean too much and it's too soon. Yeah. I still have to watch the movies in uh, extended edition. I can't watch it once on HBO or one of the channels. I just can't. Definitely not. It's just like those scenes are just missing. The Two Towers has the best deleted scene section. What were the ones in The Two Towers? I like how they had the scene with Gundor uh, that, you know, gave a little more in-depth. Yeah. I definitely love, that, you know, I definitely love the scene in Isengard with Saruman and... Oh, when Saruman, yeah. What's his name? The guy that was there poisoning the king. Wormtongue. Wormtongue. You said there was a man. Yes, a man. He wore rainy clothes, but he had this one ring of a snake, one devouring, one engulfing, you know, engulfing. Mm-hmm. And then all of a sudden, Salmon's at this, oh, so Gandalf thinks he's found the heir to the king. 
Yeah. That scene I love. Yeah, and then when Gandalf, he removes Saruman from King Theoden's body, he's like, be gone, Gandalf Greybeard. Like, he's still thinking yeah. he's Gandalf the Grey, and then he shows him he's Gandalf the White. Let me ask you a question. Sure. Did you think it was a disservice that in The Return of the King, they did not have any Saruman shots in the theatrical release? Because I think Chris Lee was pretty pissed off when that happened. Yes and no. I think that for the length of the movie, it's tough because that scene, like, as, as cool as that scene is, and as much as... Saruman's character deserves a finish like that. Right. It's such an easy scene to edit out because it really has nothing to do with the rest of the movie. But in a remake of Lord of the Rings, though, you'd be able to go back there and do it the right way where Saruman is at. Yeah, where he's at. At the Shire. That would be something that they, you know, you'd be able to go back and do. And that's such a cool scene for Saruman, for Wormtongue, and especially for the Hobbits because you think about Frodo and Sam, Sam, Sam especially, when they leave the Shire how childlike they are and they're excited to journey out into the world, but they're scared. They return as men and some bruisers are, are bullying everyone in the town and they figure out that it's Saruman and Wormtongue, but they're not scared at all because everything they've been through. So they're just like, all right, whatever. They immediately kill one of the guys and they track down Saruman and it ends up Wormtongue kills Saruman. I think he did in that scene too, right? Then they push him off the... Uh... Yeah, yeah. So that's kind of fitting. I think Saruman and Christopher Lee, I think they deserve to, to have that scene. But for the theatrical release, it's just too much that had to be cut. Same thing with the mouth of Saruman. Like, it's an awesome scene that was not in the theatrical release. I could see that confusing some people, though. Maybe people would think that was Saruman. You can't watch a theatrical cut anymore. It's got to be the extended editions. It's the only way. Yeah. Anyway, let's give a warning for spoilers. Get down to business here with what is going on, allegedly with season eight of Game of Thrones. So, heads up, spoilers. even too sure if they really are spoilers. But they do sound pretty legit. Well, first of all, well, I want to credit him on YouTube. Freaky Doctor, a yeah. uh, gentleman from Spain. There's a lot of videos in the past. I guess he must some sort of contact. Who always gives him information because other YouTubers are like, this guy's pretty credible. Uh, if he's given out information, he did a lot of videos in Spanish. And because of getting some heat, I guess, because of his info... But he's let to do a couple of ones recently in English. And that's possibly, maybe it's not the third twist. And we're still waiting for the third twist that George R. R. Martin gave the directors. You know, Stannis was the first one. Then there was the Hold the Door was the second one. Is this the third twist? Maybe. Who knows? What are some other plot points that we thought might have been the third twist? There was the one with Bran becoming the Night King. We thought that might have been the third twist. Yeah, I, I, I still think it's still possibly that. Did we think that Daenerys possibly dying was that could have been a third twist? I went there view a, a twist. Yeah, might be a shocker, but it's not a twist. Yeah, could be. Maybe this is the twist. This is the twist, and then HBO kind of hinted at this possibility in the last episode, the dragon and the wolf, and the boat sex scene. Yeah, where Tyrion is looking. They've been trying to cover it up. That. Peter Dillon said out there, like, oh, yeah, this is basically, you know, it's not good. It's good, but it's not good. So, political reasons why he's worried, but maybe there's more to it. The show ended the Cersei Tyrion kind of leaves it open minded that something might have happened in there. What we're leading up to that is the third twist is Tyrion Lash's betrayal. I want to come back to the dragon and the wolf in a minute. But first, Freaky Doctor, the YouTuber, he's the only one that has this leak, right? I believe so, yeah. There was one leak that had Tyrion as a betraying them, but it was at different starts. It was not in King's Landing. His sentence was in uh, Winterfell. So that was just by coincidence, not that he actually had any legit information. Right. So he was one of those leak guys that yeah. was just making up a leak. Yeah. 
coincidentally part of it's matching up with Tyrion's trial with this, but this is happening all on set at the Dragon Pit. See, here's the thing. Anybody can make up something, especially at this point in the show, and say it's a leak. Any sort of fan fiction, because we know these characters so well. Likely, season eight is a roller coaster of a story, much like every season that's come before it. You can still figure out different plot points that will likely happen. You can figure out plot points that have to happen. So anybody that's been paying attention to the show, especially if you've read the books too, you can fake a leak. Write some fan fiction and say, hey, oh my god, I found this leak. I don't personally, I don't think you do either. Any sort of leak, maybe I'll read it just out of interest to see what this person thinks will happen, but I don't believe it. Entertainment value. Yeah. And to speculate, which is what you and I do often. We speculate about what will happen, but... And for a guy like me, I need to know. I'm trying to see if this <laughs> yeah. could be real. I need the spoilers. Please, someone give me the leak. <laughs> John does need to know what happens. I'll always go back to between Star Wars Episode 2 and Episode 3. when I don't think that you had the spoilers for The Phantom Menace because the internet wasn't... It wasn't as big back then, no. But, oh man, once the internet really kicked in, John knew... Episode 2, I just knew everything. John was saying... John. We saw it opening night, and John was saying the lines as the uh, actors were saying it. I was turning around saying, like, now this scene, they cut so much out of this <laughs> next scene. Battle scene here with Mace Windu, uh, Jango Fett, they really cut out a lot of stuff. What about when Drax is like, Obi-Wan, and Drax, and you, like, bug it out. You're like, it's Drax, it's Drax. <laughs> <laughs> but because you do them from, like, leaks and spoilers. But anyway, I guess after the smoke cleared on Attack of the Clones... Yeah, You and I start speculating a little bit about Revenge of the Sith. We, we didn't even have a name for episode three yet. And John makes the promise to himself, mostly. And I guess I believed you at the time. That you're going to go spoiler, spoiler, spoiler free. free for episode three. Which would have been a hashtag. Yeah. Spoiler free for episode three. Avatar was spoiler free. Was I was off. They were filming. I, I didn't go on there right away. They were filming, you know. Uh, for episode three at the time. Where did you get your spoilers from, by the way? Uh, the Force the force time that Oh, yeah, Force.net. I wonder if that's still around. Oh, it's still around. Yes, it's still around. I haven't been on there in a long time. But, well, I um, guess they don't they do not do a very good job with spoilers anymore. Well, that's all YouTube now. Episode 8 was a shocker. Yeah. Um, but I just remember, what, what's so funny about it was the spoiler that ruined it for me weeks in was such a dumb spoiler, too. It was the littlest of all littlest things. You're saying you lasted one week with that spoiler? I lasted maybe a couple weeks in the, in the filming. <laughs> I lasted a couple weeks. But all of a sudden there was a spoiler like headline I read, you know, Chewbacca to appear in episode three. And I clicked on that and like next thing you know, I'm clicking on this and that. And I'm like, yeah. <laughs> I'm back, baby, I'm back. It's the internet, I can't stop. <laughs> Straight. <laughs> I'm back on the wagon, baby. <laughs> Every time you think I'm done, I get pulled back in. Yeah. I think since then you've, Fully embrace I, that. Yeah, I just fully embrace are, that right? I need to know a spoiler. It's just who you are. And, and speaking of Star Wars, real quick, I, I, when I, I haven't been going crazy about it now because of how I feel about it, but I was reading a new leak today about Episode 9, and oh boy, I wish I didn't even click on it. It was just so bad. Oh, sh- all right. Well, heads up possible spoilers for Episode 9. What would you read? Ah, oh, God. Uh, they're going into the Outer Planets, and. Uh, Leia, somehow, still going to be alive somehow. They're going to do some sort of CGI, I guess, or something. What, she must have, what did she, like, film, like, fucking two hours of unused footage for uh, Force Awakens? You know what? Honestly, honestly, dude, I, I hate to sidestep you here, but they should have foresaw this. Like, once fucking Carrie Fisher rolled in for day one of filming on The Force Awakens, they should have taken a fucking good look hold at on, her. And hold be on. Like, I did not say that. Sean said that. <laughs> I did not say it. Well, it's, she's been yeah. dead long enough. Like basically, what you say is that they, they couldn't like couldn't see like did, how know, long did they think that she was going to stick around? Like, yeah, the shit show that was Carrie Fisher walking in. Yeah, oh god, we're getting killed. We're getting here's, no viewers. Here's the here's the deal, man. I feel like George Lucas would know his actors well enough. Where if he was doing this, I gotta get rid of I gotta get rid of Leia before right. the second act, or I need to cover myself and film like a bunch of shit that's just definitely irrelevant to this film, but could be used later on. Yeah, they should have seen that coming, especially in today's day and age. I don't think it's going to work. You can't tell if she's acting anyway. Well, I'm not going to keep knocking. Well, how many seriously do you think she smoked in a day, for crying out loud? Oh, <laughs> Kylo, get mommy a cigarette. <laughs> <Come> on. 
I need the Virginia Slims. Han, you have to save our son. Uh, all right, no problem. Yeah, someone mentioned I saw in the comments section, like, they're going to have to, like, do some sort of CGI. I just cut, and I don't want to say a mask, but, like, cover up most of her face where you just see her eyes or something. Uh, so it won't look as fake, you know what I'm saying? Okay, yeah. Like, maybe she whips out the outfit she had in uh, Return of the Jedi. Not the, not the fucking bikini one, though, yeah. The bounty hunter outfit? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I've been wearing that the whole movie. <laughs> now, well, speaking of that, that, that was part of the leak today was that she's going to go to the huts. Yeah, the huts I've, I've, I've seen that leak, yeah. yeah. And they have, like, some, they have some nickname for her, like, the hut killer or something like yeah, that. Yeah, the hut, yeah, God, God, make it end. This sequel trilogy has just been a disaster. It really has. Well, episode eight has made it seem like it could be a disaster, but JJ may do the right. It doesn't sound like he is. It sounds like he's going too far the other way. Well, I think the major problem is they only had one movie to try to fix things. And for anyone, that's going to be ridiculous. And it's not even you got to fix things. You got to fix things and then end it on a high note or end it so that people that like Star Wars feel good with the ending. And I don't mean like a feel good ending, but I mean, it has to feel like a complete story. Because it already did, and you just dragged all these characters out, you know, to give them more of a story. And saying that this story is equally as important as the story that came before. So it's rough. It's a rough spot that J.J. Abrams is in. If I was J.J. Abrams, I might have told them to... Count sand. <laughs> yeah, or might have told them to go give Colin Trevorrow a call. <laughs> Get Ryan. Dude, how did that dude even get that gig in the first place, Colin Trevorrow? Pat has some movie by him that he really likes. I, I don't even remember the name of it, and I can't find it anywhere. But he did Jurassic World, which is like a slam dunk because of the nostalgia factor. Mm -hmm. He didn't direct Jurassic World 2, no. but he produced it. But it sucks. Absolutely zero dialogue. So it must have been like an 80-page fucking screenplay. It's just dinosaur action. It's hard to keep making that movie. Jurassic Park is and always will be one of my favorite movies of all time. The Lost World Jurassic Park, it's okay, but the magic of those movies is seeing the dinosaurs. So Jurassic World, enough time had passed, it was a nostalgia thing, and that's why it worked. My point is, is that Colin Trevorrow was lucky with Jurassic World, and I, I don't honestly know what kind of director he is, and I can't based on just that one movie, but the dude was fucking talking about like filming episode nine actually in space. Do you remember him saying this? Really? Yeah, I mean, he was fired shortly after that. He's like, I think, we, I think we can actually film in space now. I think it's time. It'd be great to get some actual shots in space. What the fuck are you talking about, bro? How are you going to film it? Like, what are you going to bring a film crew to space and film? Are you going to bring Carrie Fisher up to space? What are you talking about? And he was fired shortly thereafter. And Disney keeps a tight lid on stuff like that. I'm real curious as to why they did that. What was his plan for episode nine that they fired him for that they didn't even look the other way when Ryan, uh, what the fuck is the guy's name? Johnson. Ryan Johnson. When he comes to them with his treatment for episode eight, they're like, all right, yeah, all right. What could Colin Trevorrow's idea for episode nine have been that he was fired? But that scene with the huts, I really hope that's not in episode nine because, uh, there is a word for it. Um, an example of it is in Batman Begins. The lore of Batman is that Bruce Wayne goes to a movie with his parents and mm -hmm. they see, I believe it's Zorro. And when they leave the movie, his parents get robbed and his parents get shot and killed. That's the lore for the death of, of the Waynes. In Batman Begins, they don't go to a movie. They go to... The opera. The opera, the Deflator Mouse opera. And Christopher Nolan's reasoning for that is because you're watching a movie. So if you're watching a movie and the characters in the movie go to a movie, it takes you out of the movie. It takes you out of the tale when the characters in the movie are doing the same thing that you're doing. Obviously, you see movies where characters go to movies or are watching a movie. That's not, that's not what he's saying, but he's just saying for that story. Being that you're not reading a comic book, you're watching a movie, it works better that they go to the opera. It's sort of along those lines where we remember Return of the Jedi. A lot of people remember Return of the Jedi and Jabba the Hutt. Everybody knows that Leia killed Jabba the Hutt and how she did it. 
it's already in our head and in our heart as an important event in Star Wars. So to come back to it all these movies later and romanticize that part of Return of the Jedi in whatever Episode Nine is, it, it cheapens Return of the Jedi more so than the existence of the sequels already do. Right, because it's saying, we know you guys all like this, so we're going to make a big deal out of it. It's already in our head, in our heart. By you making it as important as it is to us in the mythology of the story that we're watching, you make it less important to us. Does that make any sense? The things you like about a character, the things you like about a movie, the filmmakers want you to like those things, but that are important parts of your childhood. It's kind of like they're exposing that. They're taking advantage of us. It's like a cheap ploy. I just don't get how how they're like, oh, well, the Hutch family now hates Leia. But like, oh, we'll fight on her side after some discussions because we want to kill her son. Yeah. Like, how the Hutts can, do they even move? Do they have starships? Do they have... The Hutts don't give a shit. Do the Hutts give a shit? That's well, not give the, a shit. And the leak, it's saying that the the uh, First Order is taking up their business or something like that. So, like, their business is hurting. I don't know. Maybe there's a way they can write it to have it make sense, but... You had Jabba the Hutt in episode one, and that was a cool Easter egg. That was okay. But now you're going to actually bring the story full circle to the Hutts. They're not that important in the Star Wars mythology. That was just a cool scene to close out Han's chapter. I don't know, man. It's cheap parlor tricks. Well, how about cheap parlor tricks? Let's get Billy D. Williams back. Oh, uh, Jesus. I, you know what? I think it's even worse than that. Because at least bring Billy D. Williams back. <laughs> You know, at least he is a character that was in multiple movies, a friend of Han. You, you could justify bringing him back. But the Huts, it's, it's taken advantage of my childhood, more so than, than they already are. At what point do you not see Episode Nine? Are there any spoilers that could come out that would make you just not see it? Really, at this point, it's just a matter of the break. Yeah. I mean, I'll be there opening night or opening day or the next day, depending on work schedule and all, and I'll watch it. But I don't know. You're in two months away. Yeah. It'll be interesting to see where they go after that, but anyway, how do we even get on the subject of I don't know, spoilers. Oh, spoilers, spoilers. Point being, so John is, he needs the spoilers. He has to have them, and he's going to get them. If they're there, he'll find them. Um, so, I mean, you are an expert on spoilers. Do you think this guy's spoilers are legit? I'm going to lean yes. I'm just going to lean yes, because a lot of other YouTubers like, have gone the back for him that, you know, he's got legit sources in the past. You were telling me off air that this guy, basically everything that happened in season seven, he had been able to spoil that. Mm -hmm. But that's not as impressive because season seven was out there. But season eight, it's impressive because how tight the security has been. Now, what gets me with this guy, which makes me think that he might be right, or at least he may have a contact that while he doesn't know exactly what will happen, he has a good idea of the scenes. And I remember this when all the actors went to Seville. Yeah, they all went to Seville. And he was just saying that a lot of them were just there just to fool everyone that they're shooting. Yes. He said that HBO, with this scene that we're going to possibly spoil if it is a scene that exists, HBO and Game of Thrones production, they sent whoever the actors were. They sent them all to Seville. And Dragon Hygar was sent. Uh, the the uh, the Wraith was sent. Kit Harrington's by double. Bi right, was, double was, was sent. Was it Rhaegar there too? The actor played Rhaegar? Yeah. So all these guys are there. So you're like, what's going on here? What could this possibly be? And in the meantime, they're filming this other scene in Italy? No, Seville's in Italy. In wherever the hell they filmed it. Different spot than where Kit Harrington was. And the paparazzi, I mean, they generally follow, follow Kit Harrington first. That's wherever he is. That's where any spoiler news is, is focused from. But that makes me think he's legit. So that being said... The scene is basically, uh, what he said was there was no green screen involved, closed set, and they wanted to keep it real top secret, real hush-hush. And which characters were there? I mean, obviously, Peter Dinklage was there. Right, because, well, basically, this is the trial of Tyrion Lannister for his betrayal. That's, this is the mm -hmm. elite, the spoiler, the possible twist. And you got Sansa, Arya, Bran, Robin Aaron, Davos yeah. Seaworth, and... Brienne, and obviously Peter, and Peter Dillich, obviously. And another note that this guy made was that Davos Seaworth was not wearing his 
Well, I did some checking. I did. Before we started, I went... Does he even have one? <laughs> I don't think so. so uh, this three might have been mistaken. So there you go. I went back to... I, I, I gotta try it again. Maybe other episodes with Davos in it Nick, last, from last season. But when John meets Danny, I cannot see the hand of the king pin on, on Davos. Okay. So he could be wrong on that. The North doesn't do shit like that. If they have a hand to the king, then I could Right, so I think pin. he's wrong. I mean, I could be wrong. I mean, there could be... No, I think you're right, dude. He's not even officially handed the king. It's not like John's like, Davos Seaworth, I name you hand to the king. He's just right. working at his hand to the king. Rob didn't have a hand to the king. I doubt Beyond Stark had a hand to the king or Roderick Stark. The North fucking need a hand to the king. Also, was there was um, Grey Worm was also there, which I find very surprising that he lives. Ugh. That, to me, is a... Grey Worm will die in the books. This is HBO, oh my god, the characters love this character, blah, blah, blah. We're going to keep him living. Yeah, he's blown up beyond how much he should have been blown up. And Miss Sandy I'm okay with because she's a smoke show. But keep in mind, in the material the show's adapted from, Daenerys is, what, 12 years old in Game of Thrones? Uh, 13. And she's older than Miss Sandy. Miss Sandy's like a... 11. No, I think she's like 9 or something in, yeah, in, really, Storm, yeah. in Storm of Swords. Yeah, she's a little girl. Which is not to say the Maesters don't get down with the nine-year-old girls, but they're not going to show that on TV. But now they've adapted her from a nine-year-old slave girl to like a, a sexified 20-something-year-old woman. I mean, it's it's not really a, a plot hole. You would think a slave girl who is as attractive as Miss Sandy is and at the age that Miss Sandy is, like how are they not using her for like making her have kids with somebody? It doesn't matter, and it's not, not that big of a deal, but it doesn't really make sense. Anyway, I remember for a little while, we kind of thought that Miss Sandy was going to betray Daenerys. Wasn't that? Yeah, I still think that's even still a possibility. But uh, in this leak, it's it's Tyrion Lannister, the one who has betrayed Danny, And I guess in that, in some regards, has betrayed Jon and, and the North. But this leak, it doesn't, it doesn't specifically say how he betrayed them. It's just that he did betray them. Right. I'm just assuming now that whatever he does, he's signing with Cersei. Well, that would make the most sense. And another part that he said, which adds to this whole thing, is that Bran does what he did with Littlefinger. He just like went back in time and watched what Tyrion was doing. So he goes back to, pretty sure it was a scene in the first season of Game of Thrones. It's definitely A lot in- of people said it wasn't there. They already put it on YouTube that that scene was not in the show. But it could have been. I don't know. Yeah, I don't know either. I mean, I doubt I'll go back and watch it, but... Well, he says to Catelyn Stark, he's asking, why are you arresting me and saying I tried to kill your son and bringing me to the Vale, which are all fucking valid questions. And Catelyn keeps saying, well, Peter Littlefinger told me that it's your dagger, so (laughs) whatever her logic is to taking Tyrion, and Tyrion's trying to logically convince her that she's wrong. He does this by saying, who did he say that I won the dagger from? Littlefinger said he won it by betting for whoever it was. I think it was the Knight of Flowers that Jamie was jousting against. And um, Jamie lost. Because Jamie lost, Tyrion won the Valyrian Steel Dagger. Tyrion says, well, there you go. I never bet against my family. I never side against my family, essentially. I would never bet against Jamie. If Jamie lost, then I wouldn't have won a Valyrian Steel Dagger. I would have lost whatever I bet. Which is a good argument. It's logical. If I had been Catelyn Stark, at that point, I might have started to rethink everything. Obviously, she doesn't. I guess Bran goes back and he says that Tyrion told that to Catelyn, that he never sides against his family. I don't know what the fuck kind of proof that is to whatever Tyrion did or what whatever Tyrion does or will do. But it's a good point. Tyrion says, I never side against my family. Cersei really put him through the ringer a lot before the death of Joffrey. And Joffrey put him through the ringer a lot. Tyrion was still there for his family. Being removed from the office of Hand to the King unceremoniously, Sir Mandon Moore trying to kill him on the Blackwater, and finding out that Cersei told Sir Mandon Moore to kill him. He's still there for his family. And families fight, right? Have arguments. I mean, what's the old saying? If you can't screw over your family, who can you screw over? Because your family always has to accept you back. And maybe that's the case, and it does make sense. And I think it's something that we haven't really thought of in regards to Tyrion. No matter what we think of Cersei, it's still his sister. And that's just one aspect of it. So then we go back to the dragon and the wolf, and that scene, it's in the hand's solar, in the tower of the hand. 
Cersei goes storming off. Tyrion has to go and try and fix it, well aware that she could just lop his head off. But he goes in there and they have the conversation and she brings up the children. I guess it makes more sense now what Benioff and Weiss did with Dorne, the death of Myrcella, because Tyrion is directly and indirectly responsible for the death of Myrcella because he sent her and he has to have feelings of guilt about that. And those have to outweigh, at least with the Tyrion in HBO's Game of Thrones, would feel guilty about that. And that feeling of guilt would probably outweigh whatever anger he had at Cersei. What are your thoughts? Do you think that scene adds validity to this possible spoiler? Uh, yes. This would be a way for Tyrion to make amends for that. It would be to protect this new baby that she's going to have, which we all know it's, she's not going to have this baby. It's going to be a miscarriage. That's just going to make this even worse on Tyrion's spot. You know, he's, what he's going to be turning, betraying Danny for is for a dead baby. I highly doubt that this baby that she has is going to live. I think she, this, I think Cersei's going to have a miscarriage. Or she might even die before the baby's even born. You know what I'm saying? Right. But definitely the way that he came back and we knew that Cersei was not going to aid. And then all of a sudden Tyrion said, comes out and says, oh, she's going to help out. That kind of tells you that, like, Tyrion's already sided with Cersei, I think. Dude, you know what? I just watched this episode. I was thinking about watching Beyond the Wall, but I decided to watch The Dragon and the Wolf. But I can't for the life of me remember how the conversation ends on screen. I know they don't say, all right, goodbye, or... It just cuts. It just cuts out at, I guess, an emotional climax. And then she comes back out after John and Danny had that whole entire speech about how... Danny says she can't have children, and John says, well, who said that? You know, the person who said that was a witch who tried to kill you, pretty much. You know, why you believe in her? Which is setting up that John and Danny are going to have a kid. Right. And then all of a sudden, Cersei comes back out and says that she will help. So it just makes it very suspicious. Like, all oh, you know it's a setup. I'm going to have to safely assume Tyrion's already now in the fold. That look that he gives during the, the uh, boat sex scene only adds to that. Because yeah. now he's seeing the guilt. Like, oh, I'm going to kill each of you people because of what I'm going to do. Is that what you take that look at yeah. as guilt? Yeah, the more I'm thinking about it, yeah. The more, I'm, yeah, if, if, especially if this is true. If this, if he, that, that guilt, that's a guilty look that, like, you know, look what I'm going to be doing. Right. I'm just going to assume now that, again, he doesn't, uh, Freaky Darn is going to how it's done or any of the exact moments of what's going to happen. But whatever Tyrion's going to do, it's going to be a setup that's going to, you know, be a, at least a, a momentarily loss for Danny and John's side. But obviously, they're going to win. Because they have the trial at the end of the season, then the last episode here. And I'm going to have to assume that a lot of like innocent people are going to die from Tyrion's betrayal. Like a lot of people inside that city, the commoners, are going to die at the hands of what Tyrion is going to do. Right. It's hard to pin down these specifics, but if Tyrion is planning to betray Daenerys and side with his sister and Most hated brother, character. Most hated character. He'll turn to be most hated character. But here's the thing. Let's let's go back to Dragon and the Wolf. You don't think so? No, I'm. I'm I, honestly, the jury's still out with me. I'm leaning towards it does happen because it, it does make sense. But when Cersei's talking to Jamie, she says we're not going to give help. Is Tyrion in on it? Did he in that scene say, "All right, listen"? And I could totally see him saying something like this. You know, you saw what's out there. We have to band together to stop it. But once we do, mm -hmm. I won't let them harm you. I won't let them take King's Landing. But we have to work together to get rid of this threat in the North. But then Cersei tells Jamie that she's not going to give help. And she also calls him the stupidest Lannister, which kind of makes me think there is something to it. Because she hadn't been considering, I mean, she considers Tyrion a Lannister, but she hadn't been considering him part of the family. And then to go and call Jamie the stupidest Lannister, it just feels like there's more than just her and Jamie that she's considering mm -hmm. when she calls Jamie the stupidest Lannister. Where does Jamie fit in all this? Jamie doesn't know if the fix is in. Jamie thinks it's all good, or he did until Cersei said, I'm not going to help them out. Right. But I don't think he probably doesn't know that Tyrion's in on it, but I think at this point, I guess it would be very important if Jamie gets to the north, yeah. tell them that Cersei's not going to be in on it. Then what's going to happen with Tyrion is Tyrion after to freaking lie and say, that's wrong, blah, blah, blah. Here, I just thought about this right now. When Jamie comes to the north and says that Tyrion's wrong, that she's not going to help, the north's not going to listen to Jamie because of what he did to Bran. So they're uh, not going to accept Jamie's word. Right. I just thought about that right now. That would be Tyrion's out to keep the betrayal. Jamie can come up there and say, yeah, she's not helping us. It's just me and whoever I bring up with me. I'm sure Bronn and maybe he picks up some of the guys from the Riverlands. Yeah. But the North isn't going to listen to him because he, what he did to Bran Stark. It's Jamie, Bronn, and Edgar. <laughs>
that would be like Tyrion's way of getting out of the lie because the North's not going to believe him. That may cause Detective Inspector Brand to <laughs> research things a little bit. Go see what's going on with Cersei. Is she coming? Is she not coming? You know, get to the bottom of it. But at that point, maybe the White Walkers are, I mean, the White Walkers are already in the North. So, yeah, Jamie's going to be public enemy number one when he gets up there. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that makes sense. But then what about Jamie and Tyrion? Jamie will say, she's not coming. I just talked to her. She fooled you. He'll think that, that Tyrion's being fooled by Cersei also. And Tyrion will probably mm-hmm. just play into that. The only problem with that is Tyrion has to have confidence that they can beat the Night King and the others, the White Walkers. Hmm. What if it's something more along the lines of these feelings of guilt he has, makes him realize he loves his family. Book and show, as angry at his father as he was, he has tremendous guilt for killing his father. That plus the guilt of Marcella. And he still has somewhat of a soft spot for Cersei, as cruel as she is to him. All that. Once the Night King is defeated and they head to King's Landing, maybe he decides on his own to betray them, to save Cersei. Eh, I don't know, man. It's tough, bro. It's tough. Yeah, it's got to be something that Cersei got into his head somehow. Yeah. As we mentioned before, how many times you mentioned before, how many times that Cersei wanted to kill him. Right. And he's, and he's still going to go back to you know, on her side because it's because she's family. Yeah. If this happens, it's going to make Tyrion out to be the worst character. We have to remember in the book. He's much darker. He's not as jovial and nice. But I feel like even Tyrion in the book, I wouldn't think him capable of this. Although the Tyrion in the show is much further along his character arc and the narrative. Book Tyrion is definitely more capable of it than show Tyrion. And he would save his ass. If he does it, I don't think he's doing it to better his position. I think it's more to protect his family. He's hand to Daenerys, hand to Queen Daenerys. I don't think he's going to do this to say, all right, I'll betray them if I can be hand to the queen for you. I don't think it's anything like that. You know, you give me Casterly Rock and I'll betray them. He decides to side with her because it's his family and because of the guilt he feels. Basically, what I'm saying is he may do something horrible that makes people hate him, but I don't think it will come from a selfish, evil place in him. I think it'll come from he truly doesn't know what to do, so he's just going to side with his family because he always has. But now the question, what is it that he does? What is so bad? John and Daenerys are not at this trial. Why wouldn't they be there? They have to be someplace else because according to him in another video, they are aware of the treason. Like They are aware of what Tyrion does. He must do it when they're not around. Even if he betrays him, I can't see John and Daenerys not being there for the trial. Especially John. John would take his head off himself. Right, that's what people say. Like, you know, the man who passes the sentence must, you know, swing the sword. Mm-hmm. But... What if, at this point, Danny hasn't given birth yet? What if, at this point, after they find out about the treason, she starts giving birth? And John will be with Danny then. And just has Davos there as the guy to, all right, you go there and make sure it happens. Because it's also according to Freaky Doctor, because he's been asked. You know, because a lot of people are saying, well, if they're not dead, that means that they're dead. But Freaky right. Doctor says he, he believes that they're alive during this, that, that he, they didn't die. These are the big three characters of A Song of Ice and Fire, Game of Thrones. Daenerys, Jon, Tyrion. You can make the argument for Sansa and Jamie, and they definitely seem on that level in the show, at least. End of the day, the three main characters are Danny, John, and Tyrion. So if this is going to happen to Tyrion, I can't see the other two dying. I don't think two out of three are going to die. All three are definitely not going to die. One of them will probably die. I thought it was going to be Daenerys, but if it's Tyrion. Or another possibility Tyrion's death execution was done. Not there, it was done in the studios. Mm-hmm. So, possibly that a dragon is going to eat him. So, maybe that's where John and Danny are, that they're with the dragon. So, kind of still in a way, that he is passing the sentence by swinging the sword, swinging the dragon. Well, that's assuming then that the dragons live. And honestly, uh, the more I think about it, I don't think any dragons live to the end of this story. There's a real interesting video about how we've talked about it before, too. So, I won't go too in depth, but how dragons prevent Westeros from moving forward technologically. And I think part of this story is the cycles of long winters, long summers. You know, this land that's around for thousands and thousands of years, still in like the Middle Ages. I don't think dragons survive to the end of this story. I think if Tyrion's going to be tried and found guilty and executed, I think it's going to be a Arya or a Jon taking off his head thing. Mm -hmm. But again, This is one of the three big twists. So this is something that George Martin either had planned for a while or has been thinking about for a while. So it's got to be a little bit more poetic. And I feel like it has to be based on something that's already happened in the story. 
I mean, Ned's the first thing that pops to mind, but Tyrion wasn't really responsible for that. I mean, it is kind of poetic if Robert Aaron's there. <laughs> That's got to suck for him, right? To get sentenced to death and Robert Aaron's up there. Then the other thing I think about is the narrative justice. Like, what has, I mean, he's yet to do it, but what has, he hasn't done anything thus far in the story to make him deserve death. Well, if he betrays, yeah, it's not something he's done before yet, but it's going to be something he's going to do. I don't know why, but I, I keep thinking that maybe he does something to Danny's baby. You know, he causes Danny's no. baby to die. No, it's got to be something that during the war. Jeez, I don't know how to get all this done. Shit, stuff to think about, man. I, I, I don't know. I don't know, but it does, it does make sense in terms of the three plot twists, in terms of a lot of the stuff from the dragon and the wolf. And I'm okay with it. We've heard about this for a while now. Like, it's, it's been hinted at ever since that scene aired. Is Tyrion going to betray them? I never would have said yes. And every time it was brought up, I was like, I don't want to see that. I don't want to see Tyrion make a heel turn. That's the last thing I want to see. But it's not what the story is about. You know, I should know that by now. It's not yeah, It's not what we want to see. It's just... Now, if this is true, is that you think that's better or worse for Jon Snow in terms of where you want him to be at the end? Well, does he live or die after this? Does Tyrion Rachel cause Jon to die? Corn for your doctor, he, they know he knows about the treason. You know, he knows that there's going to be a trial. So whatever treason he did, that doesn't affect to John or Danny dying. And the only reason that either one of them wouldn't be there was, is the birth, right? That's the only reason. That's what I'm thinking. It's the birth, yeah. So maybe Daenerys isn't there at all, and then John leaves. I think that would make the most sense. I wonder where Jorah is in all of this. Poor Jorah. Yeah, he's over with Daenerys trying to give birth. <laughs> Khaleesi, let me... I'll do it right this time, Khaleesi. Maybe it's mine. <laughs> well, you know, it might be mine. How is that even possible, Jordan? They say, well, you never know. I'm just saying. It could have easily have been mine in a different world. One more interesting thing that Freaky Doctor said was he said that this would be the bitter and the bittersweet ending. I don't know. It better be a really sweet ending because this is pretty bitter. Well, the good guys would win. Here's, I mean, there's speculation, obviously, we get, again, that John and Damien don't live, but again, he says they're there, they're going to be there, he knows they know. So you're going to have them living. Unfortunately, Sansa lives. That'll be bitter. To some, will be sweet. Yeah. The Tyrion part will be the bittersweet ending. He'll be the better part of it that he has to die. Do you think Tyrion accepts it? Well, according to Freaky Dot, he goes, he's begging. He, he begs and pleads to get away from it, but, you know. Nah. They say, uh, no chance, that's what you got. You're fire. <laughs> and then the dragon breathes fire on him. Cersei still dies. He's not successful saving Cersei. Right. That's like, that's like, that's makes it even more bitter on Tyrion's part. He's going to do all this for nothing. Now, how about Jaime? Well, how could you just, I just thought, I just thought about that right now. If all three ladders just die. Wow. See, I didn't think that would be the case because I always thought, I, I mean, I always thought Jaime and Cersei would die. You've been on the fence about Jaime. Unless Jaime lives. Now, I feel like one of them has to live. That theory, which I've always thought pretty meaningless that varies the missing Lannister from the uh, King's Landing riots. It was like a, a cousin or nephew. No, it was a cousin. But there's the theory that because they never found the body that Varys has him hidden away and will reveal him to gain control of Casterly Rock once all the other Lannisters are out of the way. And it's a stupid theory, although not as stupid now if this is the case, but they've never alluded to that guy in the TV show except to say, mm -hmm. I don't think he was at the King's Landing riots. I think he was actually one of the kids that Rickard Karstark killed. Point being, in the books, if this happens and Jamie and Cersei die, there is still a Lannister to rule Casterly Rock. But in the TV show, to have House Lannister go extinct, I don't know, man. It's like season one, everybody hates the Lannisters, but Jamie in particular has come so far as a character. I still think he will die because of the way he was up until he left Tyrone Hall. But if Tyrion's going to die, Cersei's got to die. What then? It makes me think Jamie's not going to die. And if Jamie does die, obviously he's on the battlefield. He doesn't seem like he's in on this plot with Cersei and Tyrion, right? So he's innocent of that. And a lot of it depends on what Euron and Cersei do. Like, no matter how angry he is at his sister, I feel like Jamie will defend her to his death. And the only reason that wouldn't be the case is if she does marry Euron and Euron ends up killing her or something. But I feel like Jamie would side with his sister. So if there is a betrayal on Tyrion's part and Cersei's alive, Jamie's going to go with them just because his sister and his brother. And he's not going to side against them. I don't think so now, though. I don't think so now. I think I think Jamie's made his 
Big James made his foot in the sand, and that's it. He's walked away from her. Yeah, but you would have thought the same about Tyrion, too. I don't know. But that, he's not going to switch right back. He's not going to switch right back. I mean, he's made a decision. Now it's... Well, the only thing you got to think of is once the threat of the White Walkers is out of the way, all bets are off, bro. You know, they're banding together for this, but once that's out of the way, Daenerys wants King's Landing. Cersei's she's going to die before she gives it up, and everything else just falls in between. I just can't see Jamie being okay with Cersei being killed. Right now, he's going to fight the good fight, which is why he's so enthusiastic about it, because it's a clear villain. None of the politics involved. He's just going to fight for the side of good, and he knows it's the side of good, whereas normally he doesn't know what's right or wrong. He wants to be right. He wants to be on, on the good side of things. Ah, such a good story, dude. Such a good story. And that'll be all three twists. None of them delivered by George Martin. How do you even like write those words after like the shows come out, the emotional climax of the final season, and then you're going to let go and start writing A Dream of Spring, like people are going to be interested in what you're saying? How do you look yourself in the mirror and let this happen to your fucking life's work? What a putz. Do you have anything else to say in regards to Tyrion? No, just basically what I mean, you know, if this does happen, he's going to come down as the most hated, I mean, for the most part, the most hated character, because especially this stuff happens after the bed off of the dawn. Like I said, I don't think that siding with Cersei would make somebody the most hated. There's got to be something else to it. But he's going to do something that's going to affect John and Danny and Sansa and the Starks at that point. That's why I was thinking maybe he's responsible somehow for the death of the child. Like that, all right, that will make people hate him. Siding with Cersei is like, all right, you fucking idiot. You know, I don't think they'll hate them. I don't know, dude. I don't know. All right, percentage. What percentage is it that this is true? What do you think? Uh, 70%. Wow. I'm feeling it. I'm feeling it. When I woke up this morning, I would have said like 5%, but I think I'm closer to the 50. I'm not quite at 50 yet, but it does seem like the writing's on the wall and it's just something I'm going to have to accept. All right. How about your percentage for buying Fire and Blood Volume 1? Still at zero? Uh, zero. Nice. All right. Well, if you got nothing else, I guess that's it. It's shocking stuff for sure. Shit, man. I wish we had waited on our definitive list of, of who lives and who dies until we had this news. Yeah. All right. Well, thank you for listening. Appreciate it. You can find us at facebook.com slash the promised princes. We are on Twitter at princes promised. We're on Instagram where I finally started to get us active, although it's a bit of a pain in the ass and I don't like Instagram, but we'll try to keep plugging away. Yeah, I can't stand this ground. Yeah, it's just a bunch of selfies. Read the Westerosi Companion, the princes that were promised.com. You can find us on Apple Podcasts, in the Google Play Store. You can find us on Stitcher, on SoundCloud, on Spotify. We are on YouTube. Please subscribe. We will speak with you guys next time. <laughs>